Welcome, everyone, to Light on the Rock. This is Philip Shields with another message that I hope brings us closer to our Savior, Yeshua, Jesus. And I hope our messages are helping you grow, making you think, and bringing you closer in a closer walk with our Master. I appreciate you coming to this website. I really do. I've so appreciated those of you also who have taken the time to get in touch with me and tell me what you think or you need or want and maybe even comment on how the website has helped you or what you need. I, I, I do appreciate that more than I can explain to you. So thank you so much. Turn to John 1, uh, verses 40 to 42. I'm going to try to get to the point faster and shorter. Uh, it seems like people's attention spans are less these days. And um, I'm used to giving hour and quarter sermons, but I'm going to try to get them down to an hour or less, and eventually down to 45 minutes. But I'm too long-winded, I guess, but we'll try to see if we can do better. John 1, verses 40 to 42. Now, Apostle Paul spoke till past midnight, and the guy fell asleep, remember? <clears throat> John 1, 40 to 42. Here's an interesting passage. See if you can figure out why it's interesting to me and why I like it. John 1, 40, one of the two who heard John the Baptist speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. <clears throat> he first found him. First of all, he went to go look for his own brother, Simon, and, and, he, and first he found his own brother Simon and said to him, we found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. You see, we found Mashiach. They said Mashiach means Messiah, the anointed one. In uh, Greek, it's Christos, where we get Christ. Same word, Christ, Messiah, same thing, means anointed one. And so he brought him to Jesus. Or actually, Christ means the Messiah. Let's put it that way. <clears throat> so I'll often speak of the Messiah. Excuse my voice a little bit tonight, but... Both of these brothers became part of the 12 disciples and eventually the original group of apostles. Andrew was so excited. Here's my point. Andrew was so excited about seeing Yeshua, Jesus, and figuring out that he was the promised Messiah that he just had to tell others about him. He couldn't keep it to himself. Andrew did not want to be a secret disciple, did not want to be a secret believer or secret follower of this man of God, the Messiah. You and I may not have the speaking skills or talents to be a powerful preacher on radio or TV or a writer, but sometimes God's grace uses you or me to bring others into the family of God who do have such such skills, who do have those personality traits that allow them to be a huge tool in God's, eye, God's hands. Andrew was used to call Peter, and look at what a giant Peter became in church history, many, many times greater as far as impact, as far as what he's written, and all of the things that we know about Peter, uh, you know, all of that started with God calling Andrew to go say something to Peter and to uh, bring that to his attention, to uh, not hide the fact that he had met the Messiah. So that's my question today. Are you an Andrew who just has to tell his family, his friends, about Yeshua? Yeshua is the name his mama called Jesus. Uh, Yeshua means salvation. I'll guarantee you he never heard the sound Jesus in his whole lifetime. What he heard was Yeshua. Are you a secret disciple, a secret Christian, or believer, or whatever you prefer as your label? Are you a secret follower of Messiah, the Anointed One, the Son of God? So let's start with why this topic is so vitally important. If you turn with me to Matthew 10, Matthew 10, it's also repeated in Luke 12. But in Matthew 10, verses 32 and 33, Yeshua himself says, Therefore, whoever confesses me, confesses me, not a whole bunch of doctrines, not a whole bunch of, of uh, sticky little points about what you think this or that means in the scriptures, but whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. Now in Luke it says, him, him I will also confess before the angels of God. So the angels and the Father. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. So it sounds very important to me that we learn to confess him and talk about him openly so that God openly confesses us as well. Let's bow your heads just for a minute. Father in heaven, we come to you, and we just ask that your anointing will be on this message, on the hearing, 
and on the preaching. Father, let each one hearing this hear what you need them to hear. Sometimes that's different for each one. And I pray, Father, that your that you, your thoughts, that Yeshua will be the one speaking, his thoughts, not mine, his words, and not mine. And we put this service into your hand, this sermon, and we ask your guidance and blessing. In Yeshua's mighty name, amen. So anyway, Matthew 10 makes it very clear that Yeshua thinks it's very important that we talk about him and confess him. Now, we can deny Christ like Peter did, you know, while the three times and the cock crowing and all that. But we can also, and we, we can deny that we know him. We can deny that we're a Christian. We can deny being a follower of Christ. That's bad enough. Or we can talk about Christ. And yet, and yet according to Titus 1, verse 16, end up denying him by our actions. And we've all done that, frankly, at one time or another. We can profess to be a Christian, to be believers. Whatever label you like, Sabbath-keeping followers of Yeshua, members of the body of Christ, the new creation in Christ, whatever you want to call yourself. But if our actions say otherwise, we are, in fact, denying Christ. So Titus 1.16 says, They profess to know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. In works, we can deny him. And like I've said, I admit to you, I have at times denied him by my actions, by my life. I want that to stop. So can you admit that by your actions you've ever denied Christ? I can. And so, but now we want to turn from our evil ways, start to live the new life in Christ, be the new creation that he's called us to be, and covered by the blood of Christ, all of our sins, all of our past, all of the accusations, all the wrath and the condemnation is now taken by him. So we can now walk forward, worthy, walking worthy of the high, high calling we have. And once we start to live it, our words, our speech become even more powerful. But that's in the next sermon. Please be sure to hear the coming sermon that I'm titling, where the title will be The Best Sermon Ever. I'm not saying my best sermon ever. I'm just talking about the best sermon ever. And I hope that intrigues you enough to want to hear it. We can also deny him by not speaking up when it's critical to stand up for things you know Christ believes in and stands for. Turn now to John 3. There were other followers and, and, and those who believed he was the Messiah, but, the, there were, but a lot of them kept their beliefs to themselves. They were afraid to come out. And I hope that doesn't describe you. Nicodemus, a Pharisee, started out as a secret follower, for example, but he did end well. In John 3, verses 1 to 2, John 3, verses 1 and 2, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, by night, notice, and said to him, Rabbi, we know, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one could do these signs that you do unless God was with him. So he wanted to talk, he really wanted to talk to Yeshua, but he was afraid to come out in the daytime, let somebody see him and report it. And uh, he does make good at the end. But do we act like some of, uh, like some of the religious leaders of Jesus' day? Turn to John 12. John 12, verses 42 to 43. Leaders who believed him but didn't want others to know about it. <clears throat> Maybe it would have cost them their standing in society. Maybe they would have been thrown out of the church, the synagogue, like the blind, blind man was in John 9, who was thrown out after he confessed that Christ was the one who healed his eyes, his blindness. Maybe their family or village would disown them. Some of you have experienced some of those things. And sometimes we get a little gun-shy about talking about Jesus or Yeshua. In John 12, verses 42 to 43, 
It just says here, nevertheless, even among the rulers, the leaders of the synagogues, among the rulers, many believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, those were the ancestors of the modern Orthodox Jews today, because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Even today, among Orthodox Judaism, uh, they put down Yeshua. They talk about him in very bad terms. And you don't dare talk about Yeshua and get away with it in the very Orthodox Jewish arena. And uh, that will change because God is working with them. Sometimes even I have been and can be a secret disciple. I don't want to be that any longer. For example, on a recent flight, though, the lady sitting on my left seemed very somber, very sober, very quiet. <clears throat> Just looking at her, you would have thought she was the real bubbly, outgoing type, but she was really quiet. And at some point, I started engaging her in conversation, and I discovered she had just learned that very morning that her daughter of 27 years, 27 years old daughter, had been in a head-on collision and thrown from the car into the ditch. She didn't know much more than that. If She knew the daughter was alive and in a coma and uh, in the hospital, in acute care. It was very sad. I have a son who's just a year older, and the daughter was in a coma. So I immediately in my mind started praying for the woman and her daughter. But then I thought, what am I doing? Let's give her the option of accepting prayer and hearing that there is a great God who heals. And so I told her I would be praying, and she thanked me. So then I asked, would you mind or would you like? And I won't if you don't like, I said. But would you like me to pray together with you right now or if you prefer and then she interrupted me and immediately said oh yes I'd love that so we held hands right there I took her right hand I was, I was to her right and the lady on her left overheard that part and took her other hand and the three of us said a quiet heartfelt prayer where I called on the name of Jesus and I invoked the promise that by his stripes we are healed and I asked for God's presence and God's strength to be with this lady and her daughter. I've got to admit, I hesitated at first. I didn't want to come across like a nut or something. But we prayed, and I left it with that. I spoke quietly. I didn't make a big scene. I did not bombard her with anything else. I did not have a long discussion about accepting Christ. Maybe she had already. I didn't discuss doctrine. I simply said, I want to pray for you and your daughter, if that's okay with you. And I left it with the prayer together. And she obviously wanted to have some quiet time with her thoughts after that. So I didn't bombard her with a lot of other conversations. She had a lot on her mind. So what's my point there? When you learn about Christ and you experience his power and his healing, we keep the focus on him. But instead, we have too many who immediately assail their loved ones, their family, their friends with the new doctrines they're learning, the new beliefs they have that frankly sound very strange to them. And so we start talking about Genesis 6 and how it really means uh, that those were angels cohabiting with women, or maybe you take the opposite approach, or we start talking about all kinds of things that make us look very strange if we bring up every doctrine all at once. And suddenly you don't love sucking on those pork ribs or you won't accept Christmas gifts or come to the, the family Christmas party. And that information will come out sooner or later. Or maybe you're talking about the Sabbath and the holy days or tithing and all kinds of things. But these things will come out later anyway, but, but really don't. The focus of confessing Christ is confessing Christ, not trying to get into a whole bunch of minutia, minutia. We have to see, and it's a lot more effective when people see the life of Christ working in us first, and we keep the focus on him. I'm telling you, I, I, that's, that's, a lot of that's going to come out in the next sermon. Turn to Acts 19, Acts 9, I mean, Acts 9, verse 19 to 22. Here Saul, who was later called Paul, the Apostle Paul, was called by the Messiah in Acts 9, and immediately after receiving his sight... If you're not familiar with the story, go back and read it in Acts 9. 
But immediately after receiving his sight, what did he do? God had blinded him at first. And we can pick up the story in Acts 9, verses 19 to 22. So when Paul had received food, he was strengthened. And then Saul, Saul is what he's called here still, spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. And then in verse 20, immediately he preached the Christ. Immediately he preached the Messiah in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. Then all who heard were amazed and said, Is not this who, he who destroyed those who called on the name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose so he might bring them bound to the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving, and what was he talking about, all the new doctrines? No, just the one big doctrine at this point. I'm not saying doctrine's not important. I said those things will come. But what he wanted to tell everybody at this point is that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Christ. That's what Christ means. It means Messiah, the anointed one. That's my point. Talk about him, his impact on your life, and keep the focus on him. Now go to Luke 5. Luke 5, verses 27 to 32. Notice that when Andrew found Jesus... He started right there with his own family, with Peter. We have another example of a sinner who was called by Yeshua to be a disciple. This man was a tax collector, a publican, an IRS guy. (laughs) Okay, people who regularly and notoriously, the publicans back then, overcharged the taxes and pocketed the difference. They were hated, despised by the general population, kind of the way we feel about IRS (laughs) right now. This man went on to write the first of the four Gospels, the, the Gospel of Matthew, also called Levi. But notice that he that notice what he did when he was called by Yeshua to be a disciple. In Luke five, verses twenty seven to thirty two. Luke five twenty seven, after these things he went out and saw a tax collector, a publican, named Levi, sitting at the tax office, and he said to him, Follow me. So he left all, rose up, and followed him. Then Levi gave him a great feast in his own house. He didn't just start following him and keep it quiet. He was so excited by what he was experiencing and had experienced and the fact that he was being given an opportunity to be a disciple of Christ as you have been, as I have been. You have also been called by Yeshua. God the Father called you through Yeshua to come and follow him. So Levi gave a great feast in his own house. Verse 29, Luke 5. And there was a great feast number of tax collectors, IRS guys, you know, internal revenue service, and others who sat down with them. And their scribes and Pharisees complained against his disciples, saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered and said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. My point is, um, actually later on in another in the story Matthew gives, he, part of what uh, Yeshua said was to go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He probably said both things. So my point is he didn't just keep it to himself. Levi, later called Matthew, Matiyahu in the Greek, I mean in the Hebrew, I mean. Uh, Levi actually threw a Levi party. He had a dinner party with Christ. He wanted all his sinful friends to get to know uh, get to know Yeshua, to get to know Christ. He was, after all, known to be a friend of sinners, sinners he was calling to repentance. And so that's what Jesus, in fact, said here. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. But even as a friend of sinners... Of course, he was calling them to repentance, but I just find it amazing how comfortable the sinners felt around this God-man Yeshua, the most perfect man to ever walk the earth. But my main point is that Matthew didn't keep all this good stuff, all this good news to himself. He hosted a party, invited all his sinful friends to give them the opportunity to meet this wonderful person. Why don't you throw a Levi party or a Matthew dinner 
and let people come and meet some of the wonderful new friends you have come to know who are new creations in Christ. Not a big evening on doctrine or anything like that, but just to meet some wonderful people who have received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and are new creations in Christ. Now, be sure you also hear in my follow-up sermon to this one, the best sermon ever, it's what I'm titling it, because there's an important aspect to being effective about telling people about the Messiah. It's you, your life, my life. I always have to preach to myself as well. And first, our lives have to reflect the awesome changes that result when someone really comes to know Yeshua. Sometimes the real coming to Jesus happens even many years after you're called and converted and baptized and all that. It's what I feel happened to me. I don't know how deeply my conversion was at the beginning. My actions, my life certainly didn't always reflect it. Not at all. We grow. Years later, we grow in Christ, or maybe I should say he grows in us. And it's a lot more effective when we speak to people and they see that we're not like everybody else. We are or like we used to be. But that's another topic which I do cover in that sermon. Combine both concepts. Our lives must evidence our lives must evidence the new creation we are in Christ, and our lips must also confess him openly. We can't be, must not be, secret followers. Nonetheless, Andrew was excited. He told his brother about Messiah, Levi, Matthew, was so excited he put on his dinner party. Here's my question for you. Would your neighbors know that you are a strong believer in Christ? Would your work associates absolutely know you followed Jesus, Yeshua, and your life clearly shows you're a believer? Or are they thinking that that, guy's a, that lady's a hypocrite? They claim to be a Christian, but they tell the dirtiest jokes of all. Or they claim to be a follower of Christ, but I know they're stealing stuff from the office or flirting with someone else's wife or husband or maybe more than flirting. But they claim to be a follower of Jesus. Does your family know you believe in Christ? Notice I'm not saying some other things as a primary thing. I'm not saying do they all know you don't eat pork anymore? Do they, do they all know you, you don't keep Christmas? That will come, but don't make those things the main thing. Keep the main thing the main thing. Talk about Yeshua and his life and how he is transforming your life and what it means to you. Is it evident, in other words, to everybody around you that you are a follower of Jesus Christ by your words and by your conduct? Today I'm talking about our words and being willing to talk about him. Question, question, because this question will come to pass in the lifetime of most of you. If it were a crime punishable by jail term or possibly even death, to be a believer in Christ, would you still be an open believer? And would there be enough evidence to easily convict you if it was a crime to be a believer in Jesus Christ? That makes you think, doesn't it? In the old days, in Peter and Paul's day, you certainly could be jailed, persecuted, beaten, later on even tortured, crucified, or fed to the lions in the Colosseums that abounded in the Roman Empire if you were a known follower of Christ. And those days are coming again, and they will be worse than any days that the world has ever seen. So we better get used to the idea of being open about the fact we are followers of the Son of God, even if it means disgrace, even if it means losing a job, or even death. I preach to myself, it won't be easy. But do learn to talk openly about things. I think some of us are, are, are getting to the point where when we're asked a question, we dodge the answer with a part, you know, part, it's a true answer, you know, why don't you come to the Christmas parties? And we have some other reason rather than in my newfound faith in Christ, I, I can't, because, you know, and come out and explain why we don't. We, we have some other reason. Oh, I, I have other obligations or whatever. And we don't come out with it. We don't talk about it. Well, some years ago, it was around 2003, I think, around there, 
Um, I was flying back from New Orleans with my broker. I'm a, I'm insurance agent. And we had not planned to sit together, but it just happened that way, that on the way back, I had my ticket and he had his, and we were next to each other. And can you imagine that being coincidence? I, I don't think so. 2003, 2004, somewhere in there. He asked me on the plane, he says, I'm glad we're sitting together. I have a lot to ask you because you never come to our Saturday morning meetings or to our Christmas parties. That's how it started. That's how the conversation started. And I said, well, I have some religious beliefs that go into that. And I said, do you happen to have your Bible with you? And he he did. He he believed in Christ. He was a godly man. And uh, he brought out his Bible. I always prefer using other people's Bibles when we're talking Bible. That way they know that it's right in their own Bible. We had about a three or four hour flight back. um, And we prayed. I prayed quickly for guidance. Uh, Let's call this man Mike. Mike already believed in Christ. I focused on the fact that we who are followers of Christ also must believe what he taught. Because it says in John and what, what the whole word, the whole Bible is Christ in print. And so what the Bible actually says must be what a true believer in Christ will do. And so in John 8:31, I started with that. I think that those who abide in my word are my disciples indeed. Yeah, we know about if you are my disciples, you'll love one another. And there are lots of signs of disciples. I've given sermons on that very topic, that very title. But I was emphasizing the fact that we have to live according to the word of God and that man shall live by every word of God, as Jesus himself had said. So by the end, uh, or as we got into it, then I started start explaining why I don't come to, because I said I keep the seventh day Sabbath, because that was the Sabbath that God himself ordained in Genesis 2 and Exodus 20, and so forth. And that was the Sabbath that Yeshua kept. That was the Sabbath the apostles kept. And I showed them the verses. I have some sermons on this website about proving which day is the Sabbath. I think three sermons. Just look it up, the true Sabbath. And it should come up. Anyway, so he asked other questions and other questions and other questions. And uh, at some point I said, are you seeing all this, Mike? And he said, yes, I, I am. He says, I don't know why I didn't see all this before. Well, God was obviously opening his mind, and we shook hands, and he understood. I didn't think much more happened for a while, and um, I remember when he was talking about the Sunday being Sabbath, that I I kidded him and said, if you're going to keep Sunday, at least don't work on Sunday. Don't be mowing your lawn, because we're not supposed to do any work on the Sabbath. If that's what the day you think the Sabbath is, then keep it holy, because that's what the fourth commandment says. Anyway, about a year went by, nothing more happened, nothing more was said. Maybe might have even been longer than a year. And then one day I got a phone call from Mike, and he wanted to have lunch at the Red Lobster restaurant. They had fish and chicken and lobster and shrimp and everything there. And uh, he said he had some important news to tell me, so I, I did. And he ordered the shrimp salad, and uh, he, he encouraged me to as well. And I said, no thanks, uh, I, I'll, I'll try something else. And then he proclaimed that he was now a Sabbath keeper. And he and I were good friends, still are, very much good friends. He's my brother and my brother in Christ. And he said he's now a Sabbath keeper. And I leaned back in my chair, remember, and kind of laughed and said, what, you don't mow your lawn on Sundays anymore? But he was very, very serious. And he said, no, Philip, from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown, I rest. I close the office and I keep the Sabbath. And I was floored. And soon enough, his wife uh, came along as well with that belief, and his two daughters, and then his friends. And Mike became a believer uh, in Christ who follows every word of God, not just accepting Christ himself, but also the, the rest of what comes with it. But what if he had said, why don't you come to the Saturday meetings and don't come to our Christmas parties? Why? Why? And I'd come up with some other excuse. Because somehow I didn't want to, I didn't want to think I was a religious nut or something. I could have said other things. Nah, you know, Mike, I work hard on Saturdays. I just got to spend time with my wife. And I could have said something that was also true. But I would not have been witnessing about the word of God. Okay, so um, anyway, just a thought for you. Now turn to Romans 10, verses 9 to 12. Romans 10, verses 9 to 12. And here he says, in Romans 10, verse 9, I'm cutting into a sentence here. 
that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes to righteousness. You see, the true righteousness is by faith. It's a gift from God. Okay, I've talked about that many times. And then he goes on, and with the mouth, confession is made to salvation. For what for the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. So we have to confess with the mouth, believe with the heart. 1 John 4, verse 15 says, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have to confess him, especially when God has done something very powerful in your life, like a dramatic healing. Of course, you confess the healer. Turn now to John 9. Here's the story of the man who was born blind. And his disciples in John 9, verse 1, ask him, they say, who sinned, this man or his parents? Because they figure that if you're having such a horrible Malady like blindness, someone had sinned. <coughs> and Yeshua said, verse 3, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. And then um, uh, when he said these things, verse 6, he came to this blind man, he spat on the ground, made clay with the saliva. We'll talk about that sometime. What, what, what does all that mean? Why did he do that? It's an interesting discussion, but that's a different topic. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of scent. Okay, of Siloam means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. I've got to tell you, I just had surgery on both eyes. And it's wonderful being able to see better again. And there's nothing, I shouldn't say nothing, but you want to protect your eyes, that's for sure. Wear sunglasses and UV rays and all that kind of stuff and watch out for those cataracts and glaucoma. And Anyway, the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is not, he, is not this he who sat and begged? Ah, well, it looks like him. I think it's someone else. He says, I am he. Therefore, they said, How were your eyes open? He said, A man named Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to the pool silo and wash. I did that and got my sight back. And they all said, well, where is he? Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, so verse 13, then they brought this formerly blind guy to the Pharisees, and it was a Sabbath when Jesus had made clay. Someone thought that was a bunch of work, that somehow he was working on the Sabbath. He wasn't. He wasn't. So they accused him of breaking the Sabbath, even though he had healed this man. And uh, so they get into this big discussion in verse 15, 16, 17, whether or not Jesus was a prophet or not. And then uh, they, they still weren't sure if this was the right man because they, this guy they knew was blind. Now this guy could see now. So they go to his parents in verse 19. Is this, is, was this your son? How come he can see now? Verse 20 is very telling. John 9. I mean, John 9, verse 20. And his parents answered and said, Look, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But by what means... He now sees we don't know. Or who opened his eyes, we don't know. He, they probably weren't there either. He is of age. Ask him. He will speak for himself. They, the reason they said all that in verse 22 is because they feared the Jews, the leaders of the Jews, the Pharisees, and so on. That's what it means when it says the Jews. It doesn't mean all Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed that he was the Christ, that he was the Messiah, He'd be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents had said, he's of age. Go ask him. So maybe they had heard already that it was Yeshua. And they were, in a sense, denying him by not glorifying God in this great miracle. So again, they called the man who was blind, and they said, I'm in verse 24 now, give God the glory. And he says, look, all I know, verse 25, is I was once blind, but now I see. And spiritually, we all should be saying the same thing. Until I came to Christ, the real Christ, and the real message, 
All I know is that once I was blind, and now I see. And they said to him again, what did he do to you? How did he open his eyes? And he explained to them again. He says, what? <laughs> you want to become his disciples? I already told you how. They reviled him in verse 28. You're his disciple. We're Moses' disciple. We know that God spoke to Moses. As far as this fellow, we don't know where he even came from. Verse 30, the man answered and said, that this is a marvelous thing. This guy's got some guts. That you don't know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. Now we know that God doesn't hear sinners, but if anyone's a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears them. Since the world began, this is the blind man speaking, it's been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he couldn't do this, this thing. And they said, you were completely born in sins, and are you teaching us? And they cast him out. They probably lifted him bodily and bodily threw him out. Now, when you were thrown out of the synagogue in a village, that was a big deal. You couldn't get a job. You couldn't get married to someone else. You couldn't buy or sell. It was a tough thing. Well, verse 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he had found him, when Yeshua had found the blind man, he said, do you believe in the Son of God? Now, something interesting here. Remember the first thing that Jesus said in the very beginning of John 9. He said, this man was born blind that the works of God would be made manifest. And basically saying, so God would be glorified. God was not being glorified here. They had humiliated this man. It was glorified in the sense that a blind man got to see, yes. But all the others who should have been glorifying God were not. Jesus heard about it. And when he had found him. See, when you've been thrown out of family and loved ones and so on, because of your confession of Yeshua like this man did, Yeshua comes looking for you. Christ will come looking for you. And when he'd found them, he said, Do you believe in the Son of God? Focus is on him. Not even on the eyes. Not even on doctrine. Not even on the synagogue. Not Focus is on him. Do you believe in the Son of God? And I ask you, dear brethren, do you believe in the Son of God? Do you really believe in him? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Yeshua said to him, you have both seen him, and it is he who speaks to you right now. And then he said, Lord, Master, Sir, I believe. And he worshipped him. And Jesus, Yeshua, let him be worshipped. Let him worship him. Because Yeshua was God in the flesh. And the Word became flesh. The Word was God. John 1, 1. John 1, was it, verse 12 or 14, I think it's 12. It says, and the Word became flesh. So this was God in the flesh. It would have been a horrible sin if Jesus had let this blind man worship him if he wasn't God. Because even Yeshua himself said to Satan, worship God and him only shall you serve. During the, the, the three temptations by Satan. When uh, Satan said, worship me. And he said, no, worship God, him only. And so Yeshua himself was worshipped and allowed himself to be worshipped because he was God. The Son of God. John nine thirty nine. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into the world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may be made blind. And some of the Pharisees were standing nearby. They heard those words and said to him, Are we blind also? And Yeshua said something I've given sermons on before, sins of ignorance. If you were blind... You might want to hear that sermon, Sins of Ignorance, versus Intentional Sins. If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. That's a very interesting verse. We all sin, but God is much harsher on the ones that when we know better and we do it. But my point in telling you the story of John 9 was share the glory. Talk about Yeshua who healed you when you've been healed. About 15 years ago, 
my doctor's office, I had just gone in for a physical, and my doctor's office called me right back, and they had some results of some testing, and they said, you've got to get back in the office right now, Mr. Shields. Anyway, I, short story, I went and was basically told, it looks like you have pancreatic and liver cancer. And basically in the discussion, it was made clear that if I do have pancreatic and liver cancer, I might have three to four months to live. My son at the time was about 12, and I remember my eyes welling up a little bit because I immediately spoke, thought of him, that he was going to grow up without a father unless I could be healed. Short story, further testing were not good. Next testing were not good. And then I did this. I had some people praying and fasting. In the beginning, I didn't even tell my wife, though. I didn't want to alarm her. And then I went in for some more tests with a specialist. And that doctor came into my waiting room. You know how you're sitting there with his backward robe on with a, your backside exposed. <laughs> and um, anyway, he's sitting there on the elevated table. And he came rushing in, and in his left hand were a bunch of papers, and in his right hand were two or three sheets of papers. And as he came in, he said, Who have you been seeing? Where have you been going? What have you been doing? And I said, Whoa, 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 what's going on? What's the story here? And he says, All I know, Mr. Shields, he said, is that in my left hand are all the reports and, and, and results of all the previous tests on you, and you were in a lot of trouble. I think he said a lot of deep, deep doo-doo, I think. You're in a lot of trouble. And in my right hand are the latest tests. And everything in my left hand is gone. It's not there. I want to know what you've been doing. And I said, remember, just weeks before I was told I probably had liver cancer and pancreatic cancer and didn't have much time to live to get my affairs in order. I said, I went to a different doctor. He said, I, I, I want to know who that is. Because whoever you went to is, man, you're, you're, everything's clean. And so I said, I, I looked up. I said, I went to Jesus Christ. And he's my healer. I guess he's healed me. Is that what you're saying? He says, there's nothing here. Anyway, in the discussion, he put his hands on my shoulder. He says, so you're a believer. I said, yes, sir, I am. And as he walked out the door, that doctor said, I have to go talk to the other patients now. He says, but you know what? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, he said. Confess Christ when good things happen. Actually, just last year, just last year, or was it two years ago? I can't remember now, 2014. I think it was in 2014, actually. I, I was told again, I had an, an enlarged spleen, enlarged liver, enlarged heart. And I asked the doctor, what could all that mean? He says, enlarged spleen can, never means anything good. And the short story is, once again, after waiting a couple months and taking some more tests, everything cleared up. Everything. Again, I'm doing it right here. I'm telling you. We have a healer. Tell people about our healer. Tell people about our God. Tell people about our Messiah. Confess our mighty God who's full of love. A time of great persecution, worse than the world's ever seen, is coming, probably within the next 10 to 14 years. I don't know when. Are you ready? And those who confess him are going to be killed. The book of Daniel and the book of Revelation make that very, very clear. And those who refuse the mark of the beast, those who refuse to go the way of this world, are going to be killed. And those who do take on the mark of the beast will suffer the wrath of God and suffer with the plagues against the beast system coming up. So we better learn now what it means to confess him openly. Get used to it. Turn to Acts 4, verses 13 to 30, uh, 31. Acts 4, Acts 4, 13 to 31. You will either openly confess the Christ and possibly be killed for it by gangs and bands of thugs or by the government, or you will deny him and face the wrath of God and be denied by Christ before the angels. 
I say the government, I mean the a coming government that is described in the book of, books of Daniel, world ruling government in Daniel and Revelation. In Acts 4, verse 13, when, when, when the priests and all of them saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they who were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, this was the lame man, they could say nothing against it. But when they commanded them to go outside, they conferred and said, you know, we've got to stop these guys. We can't have them talking about Jesus and the Messiah and all this. Let's, let's threaten them really hard, verse 17, and tell them they must not speak any more about this man in this name. Well, they called them in, and uh, Peter says in verse 19, <clears throat> Peter and John said, Whether it's right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you judge. But we cannot but speak the things which we've seen and heard. We cannot but speak, verse 20, the things which we have seen and heard. We can't keep it in. So when they'd further threaten Peter and John, they let him go. Verse 23, being let go, they came back to their own companions. And when they all heard about it, they prayed about it. And they say, Lord, you are God. You made heaven and earth and all that's in him. Who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why do the nations rage? Why do the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers have gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. I think that's from uh, Psalm 2, I think. Sounds familiar. Psalm 2. If I'm wrong, then I think it's Psalm 2. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. Okay, that's Messiah. Both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. So they're they're admitting, okay, lots of people killed him, but it was your will, Father. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that that with all boldness, and this is the prayer you and I are going to have to learn to pray, especially in the years ahead when it starts, when everything hits the fan, we're going to have to learn to pray this, with all boldness that they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus, or Yeshua. And when they prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. They spoke with boldness. And they prayed that give us boldness, that we may speak your word. And give us the signs that follow. And then in Acts 8... In Acts 8, it starts to hit the regular brethren, not just the leaders. At that time, a great persecution. This is right after after, um, Stephen had been martyred, stoned. A great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, arose. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. They were all scattered. And they took uh, Stephen, buried him. And as for Saul, the one who became Paul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house, dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered, shut up, went to hide in caves, decided to become an Orthodox Jew again. No, that's not what it says. Therefore, those who were scattered, remember they were being committed and dragged off to prison, went everywhere, I mean Acts 8 verse 4, preaching the word. The regular brethren spoke up. And we read the the follow-up to this in Acts 11 verses 19 to 21. Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose after over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, Antioch, preaching the word. And then others began to talk to the Hellenists, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Preaching the Lord Jesus. My brothers and sisters, in this coming very end time, though some will very likely be protected, from the terrible time of trouble. Not every believer will be. Otherwise, from where come all those 
verses that Daniel in the book of Revelation describe of believers being martyred, beheaded, and persecuted. I'll give a sermon soon on what's coming, okay? So be watching for it. Tell people about this website if it's a blessing to you. I suspect anyway those who will not be taken to a place of safety. Others believe in a rapture and all of that. We'll talk about that sometime. But whatever that place of safety is, wherever it is, if there is one, and I think there is one, but the ones who aren't taken, could they be the ones who at this time are more or less secret followers? Does God have to see if you're willing to take up the cross, which means death, and follow him now? And therefore, you don't need to go through this time of terrible trial and testing because he already knows what you're going to do and say and act. If he doesn't know you very well, and you don't know him very well, then he has to test us further. Now, having said that, I'm not saying that only those who are imperfect somehow are going to be the ones staying around for the Great Tribulation. Remember, remember the Son of God himself was crucified. Many, All the righteous apostles, possibly without John, had horrible deaths. Many, many of the righteous are killed. So don't, I'm not saying that if you're killed, it's because you're not righteous or you're not close to God. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it's possible in my thinking that those who don't go to a place of safety don't go because God needs to see a little more uh, courage out of them to take up their cross and follow him. We began the sermon talking about Nicodemus and Andrew and Peter and all that. But if nothing else... End strongly, even if you find it hard now to openly speak about your Savior. Paul attacked the church before he had come to his Jesus moment in Acts 9. But he immediately, upon his calling, as I read earlier, started preaching Christ boldly, even though he was often beaten, chased out of town, imprisoned, stoned, left for dead. Boldly, openly, talked about the one thing, Yeshua, the Messiah. Jesus the Christ. In Ephesians 6, verses 17 to 20, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints and for me. That utterance, talking about, being willing to speak up, that utterance, may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in chains that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Frankly, that should be the prayer for all of us that when the opportunity comes to speak up, to identify what we believe and whom we believe it in, that we speak about the blood of Yeshua and how that has cleansed us of all sin, removed all the wrath and all the condemnation, especially as we come to Passover. We have to have this openness to talk about Yeshua, especially at Passover. Nicodemus got bolder. He came at night the first time we read about him. In John 7, verse 50 and 51, when they were talking about Yeshua and the Sanhedrin, Nicodemus I'm reading John 7, verse 50. Nicodemus, he was the one who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them, being one of the Sanhedrin, said to them, does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he's doing? He actually stood up for Yeshua. You and I are going to have to stand up for Yeshua in the years ahead, I promise you, in many different kinds of ways. I mean, even things like abortion. Stand up for the truth. Speak out. Say something. How we have life through Yeshua. And that little baby and their little baby boy or little baby girl unborn needs to be protected. And that is a true life. It's not just tissue mass. It's not just a piece of... They treat it like it's a piece of snot, frankly. 
the ones who do the pro-abortion. It's not. It's, it's, it is not. It is a baby. It is a baby with a beating heart on day 18. And I'll have to talk about day 18 beating heart. They're very important. Religiously, spiritually as well. In John 19, at the death of Yeshua, after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly again, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So now he's coming out of the closet. Now he's not being so secretly. So he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who at first came by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds, very expensive. And they took the body of Jesus, bound it in strips of linen with the spices, as the custom of the Jews is to, 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 to bury. Anyway, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus both ended well. They came out of the closet, made their <clears throat> discipleship open, and openly showed their belief in their Savior. So let me ask you again. If you could go to jail or be beaten by mobs or even killed for confessing your true beliefs in Yeshua, would you deny those beliefs? Would you deny him? Would you deny Christ? Or would you be willing to, be suff to suffer for his name? And I preach to myself. I have to ask myself the same question. And take up your cross and follow him to be crucified with him, as Paul said in Galatians 2.20. Whoever confesses me before men, I will confess before the angels of God and my Father in heaven, as Yeshua said. And whoever denies me before men, him also I will deny before my Father in heaven and the holy angels. <clears throat> Start practicing the open confession of your faith in Yeshua right now. Bow your heads, please. Father in heaven, we come to you, and you've given us such a high calling. Help us see it. Help us see it so we're excited about it. And that help us have that excitement so strong that we can't contain it. Fill us with your glory. Fill us with your life. Fill us with your joy. Fill us with a changed heart. Change us. Convert us. Regenerate us. Make us a new creation. I need it too, Father. I do. I need it too. All of us do. And then let people see that new creation and see our good works and glorify you, our Father in heaven, because we're letting our light so shine. Please, Father in heaven, help us understand it and confess Jesus. We believe in him. Yeshua is the Son of God. He died for our sins, and he rose again on the third day as you promised, and has ascended to heaven to be our high priest. Yes, we confess you, Jesus. We confess you, Yeshua. We confess you, our Father in heaven, and help the Holy Spirit inside of us to bring to mind all these things and give us the courage and the power and the signs and the miracles and be ready for the times ahead that are coming. Smile on us, Father, and bless us. As we bless you and praise you. In Yeshua's mighty name. Amen.